Hello, my name is Jason Rice. I am a web applications programmer. Uh, a bit burned out, so I moved on to C++. Uh, and now I'm actually doing web applications in C++. Um, uh, this talk is about using Docker to build C++ programs. Um, it's a bit simplistic, and um, when I proposed this talk, I checked the beginner's box, maybe intermediate. Um, so if you know Docker, um, this will be really simple for you. If you know C++ but don't know Docker, hopefully I can convince you to, tr to give it a try of using it to build your C++ programs. Um, and if you know Docker but you don't know C++, maybe this is a, a, a good way to, to jump in. Um, so, <laughs> so, yeah. So here is a recent um, XKCD comic uh, about um, this guy that wanted to make this split-screen app on his tablet. And uh, so he tried downloading the, the SDK and registering as developer, and getting the IDE. And then it turned out the best way to go about it was just taking two iPhones and gluing it together to get the same effect. So he didn't learn anything on how to write software, but he learned how to glue stuff together that he didn't understand. So uh, um, C++ hasn't... You know, we're only aspiring to reach this, um, this milestone of being able to glue things together as, as easily as some of the other existing ecosystems. And I, I've been around the, the web long enough to have seen different languages um, you know, before they had their package managers and then after, and it's hard to imagine what it was like you know, to go back and not have that, that tool. Um, so I'm really looking forward to when C++ finally does, you know, mature to this, this uh, aspiration. All right, so um, in this talk, um, we'll be focusing on using Docker to set up a development environment to build uh, targets in C++. Uh, we'll start out looking at Docker's um, images and containers. What's the difference and, and what do they do? Uh, then we'll take a look at the, the Docker file, which is a, a DSL for uh, making deterministic builds. And then uh, we'll take a, uh, a look at a very simple Hello World example. And, uh, and then we'll take a, a look at the uh, multi-stage build process, which is a relatively new feature in Docker. And uh, we'll take a look at uh, building a tool chain, or a compiler, specifically Clang and LLVM. And, uh, and then we'll also take a look at uh, how open source project maintainers can use this um, Docker to make it easier uh, for contributors um, so they don't have to have such a threshold for installing dependencies and whatnot. Um, and it can be difficult on different platforms if you know you require um, like Linux specific dependencies for building things like documentation and whatnot. Um, so this, this can make it easier um, for people to do that. Um, and then uh, I also have this uh, this uh, tool called cppdoc. It's, it's experimental. It's just a Python script at this point. Um, but it kind of provides an interface that makes it easy to do all these Docker commands um, that uh, has typical use cases that uh, we would use for um, building C++ programs. Right? Um, and I'm a little light on content, so feel free to, to uh, ask questions or make comments. If you know or can make corrections, they're very welcome. Uh, um, and towards the end, uh, I'll have a few uh, live demos. And if we have a lot of time at the end, we'll do a live demo of uh, compiling made a bench. And, uh, but that's just a joke. But um, uh, yeah. So what is Docker? So Docker is, it's an open platform. It's actually a company. They have this open platform. It's open source. And what it does is it creates and runs containers, essentially. And these containers, uh, typically, they're Linux containers. Um, and uh, they can run in a, an isolated context that's separate from the rest of the, the host system, but it's not actually like a virtual machine where it has the overhead of having to run its own kernel and whatnot. Um, and because of this, it has a, uh, uh, a faster startup time. 
uh, than a typical VM. Um, and it also has low execution overhead versus a virtual machine. Um, and because of its DSL, uh, their, their goal was to make reproducible builds. So it's like it should be, in theory, deterministic and, and pure so that when you, when you build something on two different computers, you should get the same result. Although, you know, it takes a bit of uh, discipline to, to ensure that because you're dealing typically uh, with, you know, network downloading. You know, um, let's say you download a software package from GitHub or you, 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 um, you download a GitHub repo from the master branch, there could be changes on it that could break your, um, break your build uh, because you didn't anticipate the change. Um, another thing that Docker does is it has a registry that you can host images on, either locally on your box or, or remotely. And uh, um, it's connectable, deployable, and it can even be used as a process manager. So Docker is actually used quite a bit for managing services. Um, and instead of using like a native process manager, if, if let's say you built a web server or, or any kind of server for that matter, um, and uh, um, let's say it crashes, Docker uh, can handle restarting that process for you, just like you would expect with like uh, system D or some native process manager. And it's actually pretty easy to use. So uh, Docker images. So an image is basically just a file system. Um, it has multiple layers uh, on a union file system. And uh, these, these images, each layer is actually immutable. And for like a given input, uh, this, it'll have a, the same output, or it assumes that it'll always have the same output. So it creates a digest of every layer. So every layer is uh, um, dependent on the previous layer. Uh, and it caches it using that digest. So when you build it again, it can just assume that it's using the same image and, um, and just use that instead of having to do the expensive uh, build operation. Um, yeah, so layers are built in a series. Uh, with the multi-stage build process, they're actually, uh, you can build it independently, and then later a stage can copy files from that from one of the all, or one or all of the other previous build stage, stages, and then they will become dependent on whatever they copy from those other build stages. Uh, so the files system it uses a copy on write strategy. Uh, so in a subsequent build stage, if you modify a file, uh, that's when it would get copied over, and and not until then. So it's actually pretty light. So each layer only has um, differences in the file system. So if you just change one file, the only overhead of that would be the size of that file. And uh, Docker images are created using the command line tool, uh, Docker build. So any questions so far? Um, so the question is, is does it, um, I, I'm sorry, what do you mean by grab it from the middle? Uh, so if I had like a big instance that the first four steps are the same, but the eight steps following are different, and it goes off of the previous All right. Code, then it just kind of assumed that the eight, the first couple of steps are there and then leave it alone. Yeah, so the question is, uh, can it, if you make a change to one stage that's in the middle, would it like um, invalidate the cache for the rest of the stages? It would. I have a di diagram that explains that a little more simple. Um, uh, but yes, yeah, so uh, another thing about the cache is that, so it has this digest. If you make a change to the input, the digest would change, so it wouldn't use those cached values anymore. But it isn't necessarily invalidated, because if you changed it back, it would still find it in the cache. So the one problem with that is, is you can get a buildup of dangling images 
uh, and they have like a Docker prune tool that can help remove those for you. Uh, how many people have used Docker? How many, how many people have used Docker to build C++ programs? It's quite a bit. All right, so this is a diagram of the, the cache invalidation. So you have these layers, layer one, layer two, layer three. And if you made a change to layer two, just like was in the comment, um, it would invalidate every layer after that. So it would have to build. So you can be strategic with how you build your layers. Like if one has a, an expensive download, you'd want to make it in a separate layer. And if it, the order didn't matter to you, you'd want to put it in a higher one of the uh, higher layers so that if something has changed a lot, it wouldn't invalidate um, the layer that has the expensive operation. So it's a sequence. So containers. Uh, containers are like they're a runnable instance of an image. And they basically, it just adds a final mutable layer. So when you run a container, um, you start out with the, the image that you're running, and then you can make changes to it. You can stop it. You can restart it, make more changes. And uh, that's basically, it's kind of like an image, but they call it a container because it's mutable. Um, the overhead is pretty low. Um, it uses the, the copy and write strategy, and I, I believe the overhead is around 32K for a file system. Uh, you can create mount points on the host file system. So let's say, let's say you're compiling a program and you wanted to be able to have the source code uh, persist on your host server. Um, you can, you can let, let's say you mount like slash opt slash source to like the current working directory is what I use in, the, in some of the examples. And then, uh, so uh, they have Docker Compose to make uh, these containers composable. And it's kind of like uh, Odin's mix-in pattern in that you can actually you know, just have these mix-ins and you, and you uh, provide access control to different functions. But in this case, you're providing access to different network ports and different uh, like bind mounts or volumes, which are uh, basically file systems that would persist on the host. And uh, you can even export these containers to a raw file system or run it as a standalone uh, virtual machine that doesn't even require Docker. And uh, in the references at the end, I have a list, a link to a blog post that demonstrates how they do this. Um, and to run a container, you use Docker run. So building images is Docker build, and then running containers is Docker run. And this is a diagram of a container. So you have your host system, and then a container. And you can see that there's a, uh, a bind mount, which is actually, um, it's also called a volume. But they prefer the term bind mount because a volume is also something that a service would own. And it doesn't necessarily have, it's kind of like an anonymous mount on the file system that Docker manages. And it makes it easier to uh, migrate and back up. But in this case, a bind mount is you're mounting it to a specific named location on your host, which is what we'll be doing because we're not we're not doing services. We're we're um, we're building applications, and then you can also uh, expose ports to the host system. So what do you mean by outside world? Like, I, I don't want to connect to a service on the host. I want to connect to something on the internet. All right. So the question is, can you, when you explicitly expose a port, uh, does it ex necessarily expose it to the outside world, as in the internet or the network? Um, it really only exposes it to the host system. So if it, it would be exposed to your network if you didn't have some kind of firewall set up. So yes, uh, when you, when you uh, run a container that, let's say, it has port 80 e exposed, and you try to run another container that tried to access the same port, it would fail because the port's already taken up. So it uses a port 
on your host just as uh, like a web server would. So you can use it to expose it to the internet. But yeah, it depends on your system's firewall. <clears throat> All right, the Docker file. So the cool thing about Docker file is it's documentative. It's a DSL and it defines steps to build an image. And each directive um, defines a layer. So you start out with a base layer uh, using from, and then um, it defines layers that can copy files into the image uh, being built, um, or you can run a shell command using run uh, in the image's context. Uh, you can also use it to specify uh, default environment variables that will be available in any container that is uh, run, but it has to be in that build stage. Um, and you also you can specify volumes, but um, the only time you really specify a volume in the Docker file is if you're running a service. So you, let's say you want to run some server that has a log. Um, and you don't really care where it is on the file system. It's just you want Docker to manage it for you. Um, then you would use volume inside Docker file. Otherwise, uh, we express bind mounts as volumes uh, at the command line uh, in, our, in our use case. Um, yes. Oh, and you can also pass in arguments um, from the shell. So this is a, a C++ program. Um, in case you guys aren't familiar, <laughs> <laughs> all we're doing is printing out Hello World. I'm pretty sure uh, a lot of people maybe started out with this. So like I said, this would be pretty simplistic. And uh, so the file layout of our example, and, and you can find this on GitHub uh, under my um, repo, and I have a link to it at the end. Um, so the hello world example has a Docker file and main.cpp, and that's it. And this is a Docker file. It's really simple. Um, I'm reusing one of my CPP doc, you know, base platform images. Um, and what I do is I call the copy command, which takes a file from. So when you call Docker build, everything in the current directory gets copied into what they call a build context. And um, all the files in that build context are available to be copied from the host into your image. So in this case, we're putting the main.cpp file into a directory called opt slash build. And then um, for convenience, we just use the work dir, which sets the current working directory um, for subsequent shell commands. And then in the run, we run a shell command. And uh, we just run Clang with uh, libc++ and libc++ ABI uh, because the base image, that's all it has. It doesn't have uh, libstc++. So if you don't specify it, it won't find IO stream. And then this command directive uh, at the bottom. So what that does is when you run the container, this isn't part of the build process, but when you run the container, um, this is what gets run. So we're actually just executing. So when we run it, we execute the program that we compiled. Okay. So you run the thing and then run, run command? Or the build thing runs run? So when you build, it does everything except command. And when you run, it runs command. And the way it works, they, have, they actually have two directives. One's called entry point, and another one's called command. And they have a lot of different ways to use it. That's kind of complex. And I, I won't try to explain it too much. but. Um, the idea is, in this case, we have like this JSON array, and it will run this as a, a standalone process. It won't even run it in a shell. But if we just had, without the array brackets and the quotes, if we just had A out, it would actually run it in a shell it's with the environment variables and everything. And, and the reason for the difference is, is that Docker is often used for running services where you don't really want the overhead of having a shell. and it was, originally meant to just run a single process. But then they later added the ability to run it in a shell, which is actually really, really useful to us uh, who want to do stuff like build C++ programs. And, and in fact, uh, Docker is built in, in a Docker context. So uh, here's the terminal output. Um, so we call Docker build up here at the top. 
Um, and I give it uh, the option T, which is a tag. It's just the name of the, uh, the image, uh, which I can later use to run it. Um, it can also be anonymous. Um, I don't have a lot of use cases for making anonymous images like that, but uh, it does um, later give you the name of it. So maybe if you, you're doing this programmatically, you could just get the, the, the hash value from the, the output so you wouldn't have to create a name. And then we have an image called Hello World. And then we can run it. Docker run Hello World. We run the image as a container, and it just prints out Hello World. So does everybody understand the process? Like, like I said, if you know Docker, this is really, really simple. So in this case, there is no shell. But um, even if there was, it, once it terminates, I do believe that um, it would exit the shell. But there are cases like where you can run a shell where you, you wouldn't be able to get out of it. Um, actually, I'm not sure about that, if it exits the shell or not. There is a, there is a command line option. I think it's dash i for yes. interactive, and then it doesn't exit the shell. Oh, right. OK, so that, I'm sorry, the question was uh, would it would it terminate immediately or would it uh, hang around until like you you somehow canceled it with control C or something like that um, in this case it wouldn't it would terminate because there is no shell and the comment was is you can if you were running in a shell use the I option for interactive mode um, to uh, and I think there's a T option as well uh, for um, keeping it wait is that does that enable it to quit the shell I think it's terminal, like TTY. So you would want to use that if you were like in a bash terminal or something. Mm -hmm. uh, you were next. Just so you get a stash by one. If theoretically you can drop this, this image. Uh, so the idea being is you build it, it runs all the commands that you have to build it up with. And it has a command F. Does it actually run any of that F? Or is it one of those much salt prep and that's ready to go? You've got this, got this image that when you run it, you'll actually all right, so when you run build, it just runs the build steps and not command. Um, so you can see step one through five. Um, it says running. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't see that. It, it doesn't actually run the ADA out during the build stage. So it says it just like prepped it ready to go? Yes. So, okay, I'll repeat the question. Um, the question was, is um, does it just prep? It's ready to go and run the A out command. It does not run the A out command um, until you run the container. Is it, is it storing the A out file then? Yes. File yes. So you're building a file system, and the steps, oops, the steps are you know, we add main CPP, and then we compile. So the result is really only two differences, and they're separate layers the copy one being the main CPP, and then like I guess the fourth step would be adding the a out, and that would be in your. You would just have this file system with those, and then when you run the container, it runs that file in the file system. Yes. All right, so the statement was that the command directive is actually optional. Um, and I, I believe you said that the default is bash, right? No, I, don't know. I, don't, I, I don't remember what the default is. Well, I think it is bash. Okay. So um, it'll run bash by default if you run, and you have to give it IT, obviously, um, to run a container. And also, like if you were to, to create a, 
an image that had this as a base image, uh, this command would actually just be ignored. I, I, I'm pretty sure. I'm sorry, the terminal output? Yeah, it was originally meant to, like, this is what happens when you run the service. But, yeah, yes? Chris, does it automatically take all the output from the, the command state, though, and put it in the file system? Yes. Is the command necessary to copy the dot out into the file system? Um, so the question was, is does the run take all the files that output from Clang and put it in the file system? Was that correct? Yes, yes it does. So I'm not explicitly putting A out anywhere. It just happens to be inside OptBuild, clang, the clang process would create that, that artifact. And it's just on the file system. Whatever that kind of built in produces the department. Yeah. So anything that's created in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the build stage or the shell command just ends up on the file system. That's it. Yes? Exactly. Uh, yes. So if I didn't specify work directory, yes, it, it would not even find A out. Well, it would find it because it's still in the same directory as the shell command. So I, it would just be whatever the default work, working directory is. I just happen to specify opt build. It's probably not even necessary in this case, except that I copied main into opt build, I guess. The compilation fails. So, so if if uh, if the compilation fails, so any of the directives um, exit zero, it will uh, the the whole build will fail pretty much. So like also if you give the build command the uh, rm option, it'll remove failed build uh, images, and if you don't, it'll just you know the, it'll stop, and then you can actually go and mount the image to see what went wrong. Uh, the process exit code. Oh yeah, I, um, yeah. I'm sorry. The, if if the let's just say if the compiler fails. Uh, right. So I yeah. I'm I'm assuming that exit zero is the only acceptable outcome to to say that it's a successful build. All right, so we only got 15 minutes left, so uh, plenty of more content to go. So, uh, all right, so we, we did this. All right, so this is the multi-stage build example. Here's a another simplistic C++ program to try to convince you to get on the Docker C++ train if you aren't already. <laughs> um, and in this case, I have a CMake file, and it's really simple. Um, with the add definitions, I know that's not the best practice, but I have not gotten the other the proper way to work yet. But I know with 1Z it wouldn't work, and even with 11 I can't seem to get it to work. But uh, one thing worth noting is that the targets um, it installs it to the bin directory of whatever the the prefix installation prefix slash bin. <clears throat> All right, um, so here's the. The Docker file, I'm sure this might be difficult to read, but just notice that I, I started indenting each um, of the directives that are contained within a build stage, and the build stages are separated by the from directory, uh, from directive. So anytime you say from, you're starting a new, a new build stage, and you, give it a, you can give it a name. So in this case, I'm starting with my CPP doc base image and calling it as Linux. So I can use that later to copy any artifacts from this, this build into the next one. And you know I can leave other artifacts behind. Like if I install a compiler or something like that, I wouldn't want that shipped with my binary. And in this case, uh, I'm still copying main, uh, copy CMake. And um, I do the typical CMake build. But um, also, I'm specifying a tool chain. So my base platform image 
has its own CMake tool chain, which is really convenient because I know the system has a specific compiler, a specific setup, and I can make a lot of assumptions in the CMake tool chain, um, and which can bypass a lot of checks and make it a lot faster to start up. And then I set the, the prefix to opt install. So if I'm doing something like cross compiling, it doesn't accidentally get into user local where it's mixed in with like maybe system, uh, system built um, dependencies. And then I build train and I install it. And I do the same exact thing for my Emscripten build. So my build stage has the alias Node.js. And um, it's exactly the same. So I'm building for multiple platforms. I don't normally do this this way in multiple stages. I just wanted to demonstrate the multi-stage process. Uh, and we're just building for different platforms. And from, for here, we're copying from Linux and then from Node.js. That's how you copy from a previous build stage, using that from notation. And we're just copying from that stage's opt install to this stage's opt install. So does that make sense to everyone? And then in my command here, I just copy the files to a directory called opt target, which I'll mount to my file system uh, on the host. So this is a command to build. I'll spare you the output. Um, and when I run it, uh, so this V option, um, it's called volume, but really it's called, in this case, it's a bind mount because we're binding it to a specific uh, location in our file system. And I just put it in our current working directory slash target, which is where I want to put my, uh, my uh, build, built binaries in JavaScript. And uh, I wanted to do an OS X build, but I just I didn't have time to get it set up so I could run it in, in his Mac as a demo. But uh, yeah, here's the, the bind mount parameters. And then when I run it, nothing, you don't get any output just because it's just copied files. But now I can run Node.js to run the, my built JavaScript file from C++ and uh, prints out the Docker, tra Docker C++ train. So does everybody understand the multi-stage build process? All right. So building a tool chain. Um, so there's some advantages to using Docker for building a compiler. Um, one reason is, is before I started using Docker, I was typically going to some blog post that I remembered. Like every time I moved to a new, new uh, desktop or whatever, I'd have to reinstall whatever compiler I wanted to use or whatever. Um, or you can also have a bash script, which uh, would be just as effective, but one major difference is that the bash script can't make assumptions that it has complete control over the, the file system. So it, you, you, know, you couldn't have it install the dependencies that you would need to build this compiler. Um, and, and additionally, maybe the dependencies to build it could be discarded so that then you install just the, the resulting binaries or whatever is necessary for actually using the compiler. And that's much smaller. So this is probably difficult to read. In this case, um, I'm just going from a base OS layer, layer called Ubuntu, or the Bionic version. I call it fast comp build. And this arg argument um, sets up a argument that can be overridden at the command line. And then I also have to specify it in the build stage, otherwise the build stage won't know about it. So this is a tag off of their GitHub repo. And fast comp, if you don't already know, is uh, the, claim, uh, the LLVM fork for Emscripten. Called the Emscripten fast comp. So here's where we install our dependencies. Um, I use, so I have a little inefficiency here. So I have curl um, and tar, and uh, I just use that to um, download Node.js, which I should have done in a separate stage, but I'm not doing that here. I could have saved like probably uh, a little bit, a couple megabytes at least. All right. Um, and here I use git clone. Unfortunately, you can't clone by a revision, like it's uh, the git sha. So you have to use a tag. So here I'm, I, I have the convenience of using git clone with a depth of one so it doesn't download the whole history. And uh, um, 
So I download Emscript and FastComp, and then they also have a fork of Clang. Um, I download that, and then the libc++ and libc++ ABI because I'm actually building the, the backends for both the JavaScript backend and x86 and ARM, um, just for convenience. And then I run CMake for uh, you know, building LLVM uh, as release to the user local prefix. And um, you know, I specify my, my backends that I want and um, turn off examples and tests because that's really expensive. And if I ran on J4 on this computer, it'd probably melt it. And then when it's all said and done, this is almost like synchronization if you think about it. Um, I just copy all the files from each of the build stages and uh, leave the rest behind. So in fact, no, I guess I don't have, this isn't the example that has the, uh, the inefficiency of keeping curl and, and stuff installed. So here's the, the Emscript and SDK itself. Uh, I put it in a separate image so I can use you know, the, the fast comp for x86 builds too. Um, that's about 300 megabytes, LLVM and Clang. And then this adds uh, a significant amount, it, a couple hundred megabytes, I think. So it has the same. It actually derives from my, the compiler I just built. And then, um, you know, and then it depends on all these for running Python, the, the Java runtime. I'm not sure why that's needed. And here's where I have the inefficiency with curl, tar, and XZU tools because I actually later I'll install uh, Node.js which I could have done this in a separate build stage. Uh, but you need Node.js for uh, running an scripting. Um, and it's also useful for testing. Um, and here we just clone the repo and that's it. And I delete the tests because the tests are huge. How much time we get? We have five okay, we got five minutes left. I might skip some stuff. Oh, I know I'm not gonna skip this. All right, so let's say you run an open source project and you want people to contribute, but it's a high threshold for entry when you have to install a bunch of files. I like contributing to HANA. Uh, it's probably my favorite open source library. Um, and it's got cutting edge CMake. <laughs> and I don't update my Ubuntu often enough to keep up with that. So like I had a problem where my CMake was like 3.6 or something and HANA required 3.9. So I just did it inside a Docker container. Also, it has to install the Oxygen. Um, in this example, I, I omitted Ruby for building um, the benchmarks and stuff because I actually wanted to do this as a live demo and that would take a long time. For some reason, installing the gem files is really, really slow, like minutes long. I have no idea why. <laughs> so the comment was is he wants to get rid of the, the benchmark stuff. Um, and then uh, just I also installed Node.js because I was lazy and I used the HTTP server just to, to have a quick and handy way of serving the files. And I'm gonna skip this. I'm gonna go to a live demo real fast. Oops. All right, so we got HANA. And I just, I forked this and I added two files that I added a Docker file, which is really simple. I just install uh, GCC, Doxygen, Valgrind. Oh, I guess I already showed this to you. And then, uh, just for convenience, I added a make file that has the, the Docker commands. So this is tedious to type in every time, as useful as Docker is. I think the command line can be a little tedious sometimes when you do the same thing. And um, so I'll build the image by calling make image. And it was already in my cache, so it was pretty fast. So I asked to copy the files over to create a shot to see if anything changed, because it's copying files over. But uh, just to look at that make file real fast again. Note, when I run it, I'm binding port 80, 8080 here, and then I also mount opt source so I don't have to copy that into my, my image. And it's, oh yeah, it's read only, so I don't like accidentally modify source files when I'm building. And then, so I make, uh, make dev, I think is what I call it. So running it, this, I don't know if I'll stick around. It doesn't find Ruby, it finds Doxygen. The CMake is pretty. <laughs> yeah, lots of tests. Um, so we could come back to this. It doesn't take. Oh. 
Yep, I'll move that. All right, so I'm going to make that. All right, so the next, we'll come back to that in a sec. The next thing I wanted to talk about, I only got a couple minutes, I think. Um, CPP doc, just a Python script. What it does is it manages dependencies. And like I said, these are supposed to be, in theory, deterministic builds. But in practice, it is possible to make a build that isn't deterministic. Like let's say you, know, you download files from some source that could change, like a master branch. What CPP doc does is it actually looks at GitHub or it uses Git to find the, the SHA of the branch, and then it locks it in, kind of like it make, I don't make a separate lock file right now. I do want to move to that. But right now, it'll add into the configuration file the revision and lock it in place. So it always uses that. And the cool thing about that is like, if you want to upgrade, then you, know, you don't have to clear your cache because it thinks it, it hasn't changed. So here's like uh, a sample of the, the, I used to have any files. If you look at the readme, it's a little simpler. But this has the ability to have uh, more features. So I moved to uh, JSON config. So I have these, uh, my project name is Nibdle. I have a, a platform I call develop. And then the type is Linux x64. So that looks for my Docker platform image. Although you can override that with your own platform images if you want. And then I have depths. And each depth is an array because you can have multiple depths installed to a single build stage. Because some depths depend on others. And it's, it's all flat, so you have, to depend, you have to define every dependency. So there's no like recursive dependencies. Um, although I did add another type of dependency. So this one, by default, it looks at GitHub for the repo, like in this case, boost or callable traits. But you can also specify the type of dependency. And the only other type I have right now is you can actually just specify a Docker image. And eventually, I want to add like uh, Conan. And maybe a VC package or whatever. If, let's see if that I haven't seen if that's feasible yet. So, uh, so doc was made. HTTP server. And then so now it's running. Uh, it's still in the in the terminal, but it's running an HTTP server. And um, I just made a small change to the documentation. Boo is hot. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah, I had this open. So, the, the boost, boost repo on GitHub got a, a commit. I guess this was nine days ago, but I just saw this on the mailing list. It hasn't been committed yet, but yeah. Um, yeah, I think this PR is a work in progress. Um, but uh, they're trying to Dockerify Boost. And um, or at least you know make it buildable with with make, Docker. Make it so that you can make a Docker feature that contains all of this. Yes, and that would be very useful. Um, so you know if you get a, a chance, uh, check this out on GitHub and give it a little thumbs up. Um, so do we have time for another quick demo, or are we out of time now? All right, so we got a little more time. I'll just skip my slides on the. Oops. Exit that. Um. All right. So in Nibdl, uh, I have a CPP doc JSON file right there. And if I have that, I can run CPP doc. Dot um, not that, but in it, and that's what locks my revisions. But since it's already locked, it doesn't even have to look because everything already ha is locked in place. And then I can do CPP doc build, which builds all uh, an image with all the dependencies. My platform name is develop, so it's going to build an image with all my dependencies. It's really fast because it's already built. And then I run for that. I run dev CPP doc dev. Oh, you can't even see it. <laughs> CPP doc dev develop. And it just instantly creates a shell with which I can start running targets. So I can run uh, make run. And sorry, I can't, you guys can't see that. Make run example pipes. And it compiles the pipes example, which on this computer, 
I guess maybe because it's a smaller computer than my desktop and it's running in a VM because it's a Mac. Uh, it compiles a little bit slow. So that's it. So that's one way you can use uh, a convenient way of managing uh, non-trivial uh, dependencies. So uh, thank you for coming down. I appreciate your time. And I'll skip that step since we're out of time. All right, thank you.